Wright Thompson, new book, The Barn, The Secret History of a Murder in Mississippi, now available online wherever books are sold. The Barn tells the story of Emmett Till, 14-year-old African-American boy killed in Mississippi in 1955 after being accused of offending a white woman. And uh, Wright's investigation takes a deep dive into the case and cover-up that followed. Great to talk to you again. Heavy topic, but it's a wonderful story of how you tell it, investigate it, and uh, pay tribute to uh, Emmett Till and his family. When did you decide that you were going to take a deep dive into a topic that's been around for many, many, many decades? I was working on a sports story about Avery Bradley from the Los Angeles Lakers, and he is from Mount Bio, Mississippi, and one of the witnesses, it turns out, in the murder trial of the killers of Emmett Till was, last name was Bradley. And so I started trying to find out if they were related and it, they weren't, but in the process, uh, someone said to me, do you know about the barn? And I said, what barn? And I got obsessed. I mean, before this was a personal qu quest for someone trying to understand their home long before there was a magazine assignment or a book assignment, because it, it started to emerge to me that uh that this barn and the way that it had been erased from the american story was a kind of vessel for american history i mean it's you know uh my book publicist always tells me i'm supposed to make comparisons so that people know if they want it but you know i mean it really is sort of the intersection of uh like sapiens and devil in the white city. I mean, it, it's, it's one of those stories that has a lot of threads that at the beginning, you're going to wonder what does any of this have to do with this barn and this murder? And by the end of it, you're not entirely sure why this isn't how you were taught history in school. Well, that's what I was wondering. They, they sort of, this is a nondescript barn. It's there's, there's not a landmark there that, you know, it's not people can go to this, I'm guessing. And your family's farm is, what, 20 miles from this barn? So you, you grew up not knowing that that was there? I, I mean, our family farm is, I mean, our, our headquarters is exactly 23 miles because I measured it and I didn't know it existed. It just sits there and, you know, it's somebody's barn. There's Christmas decorations and uh, uh, wow. a Johnson 9.9 .9 horsepower motor. And uh, luckily for me and for activists and especially for the Till family, the guy who owns the barn is a really nice guy. And so let's people, uh, you know, let, let, let's people visit it and uh, was very open to all of this. And I just started going over and over again. And so, I mean, it's funny in a way that, you know, a Los Angeles Lakers story turned into this, but I mean, it's been four and a half years of my life trying to tell the story of this murder. And more importantly, the there's some real heroes man who are working to keep memory alive in the face of erasure and uh like i don't want to get maudlin about it but i mean it's just a real honor to meet some of these folks reverend wheeler parker from chicago who was emmett till's cousin best friend next door neighbor rode the train south with him in 1955 was in the house with him the night that he was taken the, the kidnappers and killers pointed the flashlight and the gun in his face first and he is, uh, you know, he's a minister in Chicago and has spent the rest of his life trying to keep people from forgetting. I mean, I, uh, so, you know, it, I don't, I don't, again, I don't want to sound maudlin, but like it really was the, the honor of a lifetime to just get to meet some of these, I mean, great Americans. I don't know another way to put it. What do you want to come out of this? I would like, I would like people to read a story that is entertaining and informative, sure. But at the end of it, uh, because the book focuses on 36 square miles of the place where I'm from, uh, I hope that people are inspired to want to know about the 36 square miles around where they're from or where, you know, or where they live and to you know, I'm a very proud patriotic American, and I think it is incumbent on those of us who believe in the, the, the miracle and promise of the American experiment to always be trying to make it better and to always be willing to, to find 
uh, learn, internalize, and speak the truth about the place where we're from and the place that we love. We're talking to Wright Thompson. Uh, it's uh, The new book is called The Barn, available where you get your books. Uh, have you heard from athletes about this uh, and, uh, you know, your uh, investigative work to tell the story? I, you know, I have. Uh, it, it was, I guess it's not surprising to me, but I didn't know the degree to which athletes like uh, LeBron James, for whom this story is central to his understanding of American history. Uh, you know, the, their, Emmett Till had just turned 14. And I think, uh, you know, it is it is sadly very much a part of, of education in black American homes to sit down and tell their children the story of Emmett Till and to tell their children the, the story of Trayvon Martin and George Floyd and uh, things that I never really had to worry about. And so, I, I, you know, it, it is this story is hugely important to many, many American athletes who, uh, uh, you know, I came to understand better through this reporting are not only uh, expected to be great players, but also uh, thought and almost spiritual leaders for a community. And so, you know, that was really uh, it, it was really interesting and sort of affirming to know that uh in addition to being uh the second greatest basketball player who ever lived uh lebron james is uh is a real student of american history and of uh and a really thoughtful intellectual guy what did it feel like when you walked in the barn Whew. boy i've done a lot of interviews that's the first person who's ever asked me that uh, you know what, there was a, and I, there was a real sense of menace. And one of the reasons that I wanted to write a book, not just about the history of that barn, but of the land around it and excavate the blood and the dirt is that, look, the, the, there's a life force and an energy there that is absolutely palpable. And I know that sounds like hippy dippy stuff and I'm supposed to be burning incense and all of that. And I don't mean it that way. It, it, there's a real sense of menace and everyone who's ever been out there uh, that I've talked to senses it too. And, uh, you know, the, the other thing it did for me was, you know, Mississippi and America is covered in barns, collapsed barns, barns that are perfectly preserved. And the thing it did for me was fundamentally impact how I move through the world because every time I see a barn now anywhere, part of me wonders what happened in that barn that I don't know about. We're talking to Wright Thompson. Uh, I'm so used to talking to you about sports. Do you have yeah. anything on the horizon sports wise uh, profile or uh, just a overall story? Man, we got a, we got a lot of things going. I'm in the process of doing a story to documentary about uh, a guy who's trying to catch the world's largest Marlin. Uh, I was just on a fishing boat in the Azores for four days. Uh, it's a really hard job, uh, Dan. And, uh, uh, you know, I mean, some people go cover wars in Iraq and international poverty, but, but I have the real, uh, uh, it was a really hard assignment to go on a fishing boat in paradise for four days, but somebody has to do it. Uh, you know, and a bunch of, a bunch of profiles kicking around. I mean, we'll hopefully be back on to talk about them when they're, when they're sort of emerging, but you know, those are my favorite things to do is to do deep dives into the lives of athletes. I mean, one of the, the coolest parts of this job, frankly, is that you get to try on other people's lives, whether it's Michael Jordan or Caitlin Clark, uh, uh, who we, who I've talked, both of whom I've talked about on this program. I was just uh, texting with Caitlin because her season ended and was basically, you need to take a vacation now. Yeah. And so uh, that's, that's the best part of my, of my day job is really trying to understand uh, what it takes to be great and what it costs. Would it surprise us if I said you could go back and interview any sports person no longer with us? Who would it be? That's a, I mean, this sounds like a cliche, but probably Mickey Mantle, Joe DiMaggio, or Babe Ruth. I mean, probably Babe Ruth, who's like patient zero. You know, there's that great Jane Levy book about Mickey Mantle called The Last Boy that I really love. 
because it like correctly places Mickey Mantle as the last star and hero in a pre-ironic America. And like, you know, there just was a fundamentally different way people interacted with him than say Aaron judge. Uh, uh, and so I would love to talk to a sober Mickey Mantle, uh, mm. You know, I've always thought it was interesting that Mickey Mantle and Jerry Garcia died so close to each other because they felt like Rushmore faces of a very specific America, you know, and like even though they had nothing to do with each other, they felt really tied together, like existentially to me in a way. That actually would be a really good story for someone is to write about the intersection of Jerry Garcia and Mickey Mantle, uh, <laughs> you know, but both addicts, you know, Mickey got clean and Jerry didn't. Uh, and uh so no, I mean I would love and I would love to go talk to Joe DiMaggio. I mean I, I know you've read that famous Gate to Lee story, the like silent season of a hero, where it has that great scene where Marilyn they're on their honeymoon and Marilyn Monroe uh, gets invited to go from Japan where they're hiding out, and you know she loves being famous because it's new, and he hates being famous because it's old. And I think that's a pretty common story for athletes. Both of us interview now is that you agree to accept that before you understand what it takes from you. And so she gets asked to go to Korea to speak to soldiers, like a USO trip. And she comes back and they're having the breakfast the next morning. And she's just gushing about the joy. And she says, Oh, Joe, you've never heard such cheering. <laughs> and he looks up from and he looks up from his Cheerios and just dead eyes or a deadpans. Yes, I have. Yes, yes, and, yes. Many, and many so more I, than you've I, heard. Yeah, and so I would love to go talk to Joe DiMaggio. I love that Gate to Lee story. Uh, I love that Richard Ben Kramer, Ted Williams story. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, that would be great. I mean, let me ask you this, because who is the most f iconic athlete who's no longer with us, who you intersected with? Like, who's like, what's the story you have about one of these guys who's a Mount Rushmore guy that you ended up because of your place in the culture for so long being next to briefly Muhammad Ali. Oh, that's a good one. What was because he like? I, I, well, he didn't speak back then. So I met him at the ESPYs and talked to him and his wife. I was there when he checked in the hospital for Parkinson's. I was covering that. They had fight night in Arizona, and I was the host, and I presented him with a, a ring that they were giving to him. And I was there in Atlantic City for a Mike Tyson fight when Ali came in, and it was Ali Boumaye. And the yeah. entire, the entire, it's one of the greatest moments. I'm getting goosebumps wow. thinking about it. Just he, came, he came in, and everybody realized it was Ali. Everybody in the building started chanting this. And oh. I was sitting with Danny Aiello and Matt Dillon, the actors, and I, I remember turning Danny Aiello and I said, we'll never experience something like this again. And he couldn't even speak. He was like, like you were frozen, dumbfounded, because you really realized what somebody meant to so many people anywhere in the world. And here he is in Atlantic City walking in. And I just remember, you know, so many things flash before you. But to be there outside of the hospital and he's in there and uh, you know, just diagnosed with Parkinson's. So, uh, and I'd just been around Howard Cosell, too, who had Parkinson's. I actually had to pour his water for him because he couldn't hit the glass. Uh, wow. It was terrible. So, you know... The intersection, I've been very lucky over 40 years to have quite a few of those, but I think Ali's impact on me because of the impact he had on others. I uh, I walked into the media room at the Atlanta Super Bowl. Uh, you know, they had that sort of big lounge and then the area where all the computers were and then Radio Row was on the other side of that. That would have been like 2000, 99, 2000. It was the Rams Titans. Okay. And... Uh, Tyson was fighting on TV and there was a huge big screen TV and like really leather couches sitting around. And I walked into that press room and uh, it was Muhammad Ali sitting by himself watching a Mike Tyson fight. And I just like, I can't go bother this. Like yeah. no one would go bother him. I mean, there, yeah. it was very much like 
an incredible sign of respect. You know, I just did that Mickey Hart documentary, Mickey Hart, the drummer from the Grateful Dead. And he and I worked on that for years. And we did all these interviews with athletes. And it was really interesting because he, you know, he's met every famous person in the world and he was in the Grateful Dead and has his own center of energy. And so not a starstruck guy, you know what I mean? And he was on the phone with Layla Ali and you could tell, I mean, Mickey was about to cry just being in her virtual presence because of uh, how much Muhammad Ali meant to him as, as a brave warrior, as a great fighter, as someone who was willing to push all of his chips into the middle of the table to bet on something that he believed in. It was really interesting to sort of see Mickey get really starstruck. And then the other one was, you know, Bob Cousy is alive and well yeah. and uh, living in Worcester. And uh, it was Mickey's childhood hero. But to see the, him talking to Bob Cousy and Bob Cousy <laughs> talking about liking the Grateful Dead was one of the most out of body experiences of my whole life. I was just like, this is crazy. I can't believe, you know, I'm, I, we're on a Zoom just like this one. And, you know, hi, Todd. He's down below us. His camera's off. I was like that. I was just, my camera was off and my jaw was hanging open as Mickey Hart from the Grateful Dead is talking to Bob Cousy from the Boston Celtics. He's Wright Thompson, and the new book is The Barn, The Secret History of a Murder in Mississippi. And uh, it's available now online wherever books are sold. Great to catch up with you. Hope the uh, girls are treating you well, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, buddy. Thanks, Dan. Girls are great. Uh, and, uh, talk to you soon, man. That's Wright Thompson. Well, we have a pretty good streak. Whenever he comes on, we make his, uh, his book a bestseller. It's probably already a bestseller, but always love talking to him.